This that new media company covering everything. I'm talking that news, you ain't heard of. Cause you know it's getting buried. Social justice, get yeah, us stuff you need to know about. Talking politics that the corporate news won't cover. You know they don't think that you could see under. But you can now, cause the people we cover, they may not be famous, but the story should be heard. Yeah, every voice matters. We should. Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the program this morning. And this morning, we are delighted to have a special guest with us. Uh, so first, let me introduce my lovely and talented co-host, Andy Kennedy. Good morning. Good morning. How are you this morning, lovely Carrie? Um, I'm good. Um, yeah, no complaints. I have zero complaints, so... No, I do. I always have complaints, but we'll table that for just a second. <laughs> <laughs> I was just say, it's a little early for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then we also have a wonderfully talented special guest, Miss Cindy Hay Hayden or Haddon? Haddon. Haddon. Miss Cindy, she's joining us from Washington State, up bright and early with the the birdies this morning. Good morning, Cindy. How are you? I'm wonderful. How are you? You hanging in? Uh, hanging in there. Absolutely. So uh, the reason we invited Miss Cindy here this morning is because Cindy reached out to us on our Facebook page with this, um, I don't want to call it a rant, but it was a, a powerful um, emotional message. And it just made more sense for Cindy to deliver it herself so that we could talk about it and, and what she wanted to do. So um, Miss Cindy, you want to jump right into it? Sure. Well, um, for one, I want you to know I use capitals not in anger, but because I'm trying to get, I'm an artist, and the visual for someone to see all caps may gain your attention to a point I'm trying to make. I don't know why I do that, but sometimes I get scolded. Are you angry? <laughs> <laughs> No, it makes sense. Makes sense. So, so tell everybody kind of uh, the gist of what you wrote. Well, uh, the news yesterday went on all day and night on the subject, and I started uh, bright and early uh, with the idea that uh, Wisconsin voters were told pretty much last minute by a, by judges that they would have to go vote uh, despite the pandemic. And I, I thought about the history a little bit and how a lower court had said, yeah, I don't see why it would be wrongful for them to hold off till maybe June to, to do it. And um, then I think I heard Trump mention the day before during his conference that he had talked to a judge and he was gonna get it all straightened out. Did you know that he knows the best judges? Yeah, oh yeah. He knows the best people, right? Mm. <laughs> and so, anyway, yeah, came back that uh, five to four votes said, no, you'd have to go out. And so I started thinking a lot about that. And basically what that told me was that judges, the judges were now telling Americans that if your vote is important to you, if the country is important to you, um, you need to face possible death to do what you have to do for your country. Go vote. Isn't that the same argument that we heard for um, older Americans to go shopping? That if you're a patriot, you're going to go out and shop regardless and support your small business. And if you die, you die. Who is it? My, um, Mike Huckabee was the last one to forward that so so cindy are you saying you're not a patriot what i, I don't get it <laughs> no what i was saying is um i've been an activist all all of my life uh in between my life but it's always been on my plate i've always been uh feet in the streets and to go shopping, but if you're whatever patriot. but I started thinking about the mandate that those judges gave to people and said, well, what if we took that more seriously? And what, what I did was I posed a question um, to, to readers, what if while the streets were empty and our patriotic duty 
to do something about this country that is already fascist and is changing all of our systems. Look at the people in, and uh, offices he's, he closed last night. Uh, rapidly, while we're ill, you know, um, why wouldn't we choose to get out in the streets and put our masks on and do our patriotic duty and our right to protest, you know, would be the same as our right to vote. And could they be viewed equally? Will people be afraid to get out in the streets? And then I ask people, you know, why do we not get involved? And why are we so worried when we see all this going on and we see all the money being spent and we don't um, want to elect a Bernie Sanders that we all want to go the direction and progress the country in the directions he's talking about. Why do we want to question, well, how much is that going to cost? You know, why is that more of a priority for us um, to accept that and stay, you know, at home and not be involved in doing what we need to do? The country is in terrible jeopardy. I, I know everybody is aware of that. Um, and I think the only thing they fear, the only enemy these leaders know, is the populace and how big we can grow. And then lastly, I posed in, in my little effort there was, um, why, why can't uh, people see with the steps that Trump is making that, and Barr, Attorney General Barr, um, to seize and suspend constitutional civil rights and protections and that they're asking, actually asking Congress for the right to arrest people without charging them. You know, it dawns on me that they fear us and they think we're afraid and we are at home without a plan and we'll just put up with it. And uh, even our, our children's future isn't going to prevent us from, from our fears. And um, what do you think they'd do if we did rise up? If we just walk the streets, whether it's violent or nonviolent, the plan is that on their end to arrest us, put us away. Well, um, I I think that we can point to, uh, you know what, it's a good question. I, d I don't know. I think every state response would be a little bit different, but I want to look back at uh, the Women's March in D.C., and you had how many million people there peacefully, you know, their mm -hmm. constitutional right. Um, I, I don't know that that had any effect. So it, it is worth exploring Right, so you've got the example of what's going on in France with the yellow vests, and mm -hmm. and they have most of them are peaceful, some are not, um, and then contrast that with what we had with uh, the women's march. I have long thought about this. What is it going to take for Americans to stop being complacent? And mm -hmm. and I. I don't well, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's the narrative that most uh, Americans are getting from mainstream media, right? It's, it's hard to organize I a agree. mass protest like that because you can't get the word out to people because you've got, uh, you know, news outlets, well, news outlets mm -hmm. like uh, CNN and MSNBC and Fox News that that will not uh, broadcast any of the news of that nature, right? It's all good, everything's fine, you know, nothing to see here, move along, and that's the issue, that's the problem. Unless it's, it's sensational in numbers. Yeah, the clickbait stuff, absolutely. Um, I, I think that, that you're right on that front. And I wanna take it in a little bit different direction. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna toot our own horn here. So an example of this is in Chicago, you had this huge headline about COVID-19 and the disproportionately high numbers of black men 
who are, are succumbing to this this virus and that was it they stopped right there so it was a sensational headline whereas what we covered and we have been covering since uh january was the uh racial discrimination and environmental justice issues that led up to this and now we can tie a direct scientifically proven correlation between pollution in minority and poor areas to the dire effects of covid and so we're mainstream media the corporate media stopped at black men are dying we're like yeah we know and we told you this was going to happen because we were able to put the corporations and the polluters in in direct conflict with the health and welfare of our own public who happen to be um majority minorities so of course there's a direct correlation and a causation between these two things so so you're right the the corporate media is not going to tell that story right and and we need that work to be done because there will be people to who listen in that vein of fact finding you know um those coalitions and and all of that um i, I just i you know i think that i think the bottom line is well look, look okay look at seattle in 1999 the the uh, riots, uh, World Trade Organization riots that mm -hmm. happened here. They planned for six months for that coming. And it was comprised of church groups and uh, justice groups, but also some of the others who purposely designed some violence, okay, breaking of windows and stuff, and then had to fight the media not reporting correctly at the time saying that people were throwing gas bombs and stuff at the mm -hmm. police and they had to retract later. And so who's getting what fact out of that? They, they look at the, the protest as being somewhat successful in that they did get the media to start talking about uh, uh, the World Trade WTO issues mm -hmm. and what it would mean to all of us. And so, you know, you're not, what I've learned is that you can teach nonviolence, you can be nonviolence, you can be in groups that are nonviolent, but people are complex and somebody's going to throw a ringer in it somewhere or a group will. And we have to, I think the bottom line is we have to keep moving forward. And I think people are kind of afraid to move forward, whether it gets violence or whether not somebody is going to harm them and they don't feel significant. And the tool that we have are our numbers. That's it. That's all we have because they're pretty much ruining voting for us. Uh, yeah. how, you know, how are we going to know this, this election with all he, uh, he has tried to do to cheat? You think he stopped at the impeachment thing? So he, you're talking about Trump. Yes. Okay. So any way he can cheat in any way they can cheat, they'll continue to do. They've done it for decades. The gerrymandering, the pushing people off the rolls the poor and black or people of color communities, mm -hmm. you know, right, like, all like we, we have, we've been setting like, uh, it's the false sense of choice, right? It's uh, that yeah, I love the uh, George Carlin rant, right? That Americans mm -hmm, yeah. think they have choice, right? You don't have choice. No. Your choices are paper or plastic or smoking or non-smoking. That's all. That's the only choices you have. You don't choose which which person runs the country. There's one party, and mm -hmm. there's a Democratic faction and a Republican faction, mm -hmm. right? And that's all. That's the only choices you have. It's going to take a mass movement of people, but it's also going to take a entity that has the ability to disseminate information. Right now, the biggest group in both the United States and Canada, I, I believe, are the progressive left mm -hmm. or the independents. The problem is we don't have a single voice that, that will, you know, 
disseminate information. You've got all these different factions of progressives all sitting in the same boat. We've all got oars. Mm -hmm. We just have to learn to start rowing together. Once that happens, then, you know, the game changes exactly. completely. For a number of years, I've written to um, progressive organizations, Move On and, and others, and said, you know, we have to show our numbers. Can't you guys, even you guys who have boardrooms and you sit down and do, you decide how your, your organization is going to work and what your list of important things you're trying to achieve and to do, can't you put all of that aside and several of you come together and create uh, w one list for a short period of time, a list of demands, you know, four or five of them that we all fly under and, and get the media sources we can get to, to spread that out. And then, you know, I, I think that would be a helpful uh, thing that can be done. If people really care about this country, I think um, we have well, to start thinking. Cindy, let me, let me ask you a question. You mentioned move on, and I, I'm not going to personally hold you responsible for this, but <laughs> um, I, I wonder if some of these groups that we've seen, um, the way that they are funded has an effect on what they are willing to do. So, um, for yeah. example, move on is also corporate funded and establishment funded. Um, and then I was having a conversation with somebody on Twitter who is a member of Indivisible, also corporate funded. And, and they were they had some things wrong about how the primary system actually works. And my pushback to them was, isn't Indivisible teaching you about how primaries work and what the rules are? And why would they not teach you that? Because that is powerful. If you read, you know, and, um, hate to invoke the name of Don Ford, but um, he said it for years. If you would just read the rules and the bylaws of the DNC, you are already further ahead than most DNC members themselves. Um, yeah. Right, and Jason Eno said it too. So, so do you think that uh, Move On is not moving in that direction because of their funding? Well, I, I think that all, all of them cater to their funding. I mean, here's, here's another situation. I remember calling the Susan Comini uh, many, many times organization over the cancer thing, saying, my gosh, we have been marching, biking, riding, singing to end cancer in this country and spending Lord knows how many trillions of dollars in donations and I said, why don't we have a cure yet? I don't know. I don't know anything about that or the records. All I know is I call people for donations or I wouldn't have a job. Mm. So, you know, we, there is nothing today we can trust. And so we have to dig harder to tell people what we want as Americans and, and seek to regain trust and truth through, through those things, I think. Okay, so let me follow up that question about funding, right? So um, we have Bernie Sanders, who is not taking corporate money. He's not taking PAC money He's or, or dark PAC money. I guess you could reasonably argue that our revolution is a PAC, but it's still small donations. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, <clears throat> excuse me, other candidates who are taking PAC money and things like that. Do you think that the the way that funding comes through from small individual donors lends to a sense of credibility and accountability that is not there um, for the, the big dark money issues. Yeah, I, I believe it does because I think it's empowering for the individual to see <coughs> when we come together what we can do. I was really amazed how much money comes out of all of us from any economic and and he 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 can make millions of dollars overnight or any of these other candidates that tried that with donors um so i thought okay so it's not really the money that's the problem uh what the problem is no one nobody's just trusting corporations whose lobbyists have filled 
the people's <coughs> house for decades at a clip that is unbelievable, you know, and essentially has purchased the government. This is a huge, huge job. I, I don't know if we're going to lose our democracy or not, but I, for one, am the kind of person, and having done justice work in various areas over my life, I know there's only one thing we can do, and that is to press forward. We have to move forward. We're not teaching kids in school about government anymore and politics or history. I mean, when I was in sixth grade, before I was allowed to graduate and go to a new junior high school, I had to pick a time to uh, request to go down and stand in front of the principal of my school at his great big oak desk and recite by heart the preamble to the Constitution. And I've never forgotten it. You know, it's amazing uh, the things that we do not do anymore to inform people of who we are, how we are supposed to work, you know. No wonder when you mention uh, democratic socialism, they all move to, oh my God, communism's coming in. <laughs> right. Don't... right, exactly. <clears throat> you know, we're not well, now, the problem, a lot of that problem is that, um, you know, if you're old enough, then you went through the decades and decades of the Red Scare, right? Mm -hmm. Of the Soviet Union and communism bad. And, and so it's easy to trigger people of that era because mm -hmm. if you all you have to do is say socialism, oh, well, I heard somewhere that's communism. Well, that's bad. Yeah. You know? When I was young in school, we had the air raids and had to get under our desks. We had two flags, one in each corner of the classroom. One was the American flag to where we said the Pledge of Allegiance, and the other one was the Christian flag at the time. People, I still talk to people today that don't understand when that flag came in and when it was moved out in mm -hmm. a relatively short period of time. It wasn't in our, uh, it wasn't by the founders, you know. Um, so there's been, there's been a lot of change, and here's, Here's one of the things I think that's kept me going too is we have to accept the fact that change is the only constant in the universe that we can count on and trust. We're going to have to get along with change. Right. And when I started doing some larger uh, participating in national groups around the country and all, um, I remember I started by going to a seminar and the speaker came to the podium and said, would you just raise your hand if you believe that people can change? And I raised my hand up thinking everybody in the room, I looked around, there was about three of us in the whole room. What a cynical crowd, oh my goodness, wow. Well, and this was back in 1998. So and I thought it was the most natural thing that everybody believes because we grow. So, and, and then I started thinking about passions. You know, people go, well, I don't have a passion for this. And where these come from in our life. I think that passion, uh, the, the number one thing that should drive our passion as a people is um, um, the ability to make a cognizant decision that I want to learn which means we have to listen. I want to learn. And we're on a journey of learning things about ourselves and things that are important. The other thing that creates passions for justice work is our personal experience. But then suddenly that can divide us because mm -hmm. if all we're looking for is our personal justice and getting involved in any kind of wonderful group, because of something that happened to us or someone we know, are we, are we really passionate for, about it uh, for the right reasons? And will it fizzle out? Usually people are in and out of the justice movement because they fizzle out. Um, do you think some of that fizzle, because I, I experienced it too, I, I, I used to be a lot more um, hopeful and then I went through some, um, so I became an active member of my local Democratic Party and I ran for office and did all the things that I was supposed to do and truly was a true believer. 
And then something happened where, because I was too vocal about asking for greater transparency and, you know, where's all the money going that we're donating to our party and why do we keep passing the hat and why, it didn't make any sense. So because I started asking those questions, now I was a target and I, um, you know, was a target of harassment and there was a big whole story that went behind it, but that made me cynical because mm -hmm. I could see that the people that I, that uh, to the left and right of me that I thought of as allies, when push came to shove, um, were not my allies, right? So I, I think part yeah. of this is in every organization you have, and I go back to, you, you mentioned school, we had to memorize Shakespeare's um, All the World's a Stage. And in that, it talked about. Um, Good Lord! I know <laughs> we had to, it was a long. We had to memorize the whole thing and recite it, um, but it stayed with me in the same way that civics did, um, because in it it talked about you will have that moment where you are challenged, where what mm. you believe will be put in the spotlight, and you are going to have to stand up while everyone else falls. So um, I think we don't have enough of that, enough of people who are willing right. to stand up and be alone in that. And, and you speak the truth. It's a, it's a loner job. You, you make more enemies than friends. And what has helped me uh, personally on that part of, of the journey in doing justice work, I think has been, um, I was able to learn okay, people are always going to let me down. The only person I can trust is going to be me. What tools do I have to stay hopeful and involved? And I think those would be, um, uh, we have to uh, use our, our intellect. We have to, you know, our decision to, to m make good choices. For instance, on this virus thing, just real quick for a moment, sidebar. One of the first things the people came out to tell us was uh, Governor Cuomo and some uh, executives, uh, medical executives, was there are no good choices here. None whatsoever, no good choices. The only thing we can do is make good decisions. And Cuomo said, make a list. Make a list of all the negatives and make a list of the positives. Do it daily. And, and they are telling you things are going to change. And we have got to grasp that and be ready. And it's okay because change is the only thing we can count on. So um, intellect is one. Um, our faith is another. You know, every one of us has faith. Every one of us. It takes faith to say, I believe in God or Buddha, it takes faith to say, I don't believe in any of it. It's an act of faith either way. This is our collective uh, things that we share together as humanity. And we don't look at the things we have and that we share and use. And then I think third is our intuition. Um, when we go into a riskful situation or something that could become risky. Um, in my life, I, I had a rough childhood and protected my siblings. Um, I picked Jesus to talk to from the time I was three and four years old. And that's remained, you know, it's a habit that even if I didn't want him in my life anymore as a teacher and a mentor, who I look at that person as being, um, yeah, you know, you have to, you have to Put your faith in your uh, intuition that your higher power, whoever it is, even if it's yourself that you're investing in, um, you know, I think that um, we use the gift of intuition to know we'll be safe. And then we have to also recognize the reality that we might not be safe, huh. you know? Right. Uh, I know biblically uh, it's... Um, those that give down their life for another. We uh -huh. see that happening today with all of our medical people and everything. They don't want to be there. They wouldn't be running into that fire if they weren't told to, right? 
Um, I don't know. And Andy, um, I don't know if this is hitting too close to home because Andy's wife is right on the front line. But um, we had talked at length about the personality um, of somebody who's going into the healthcare field. Nobody goes into it to become a millionaire. So that personality is the same one who is in the hospital without the proper protective gear. Yeah, he's yeah. the PPE. Right, that's exactly right. So they're still there knowing that they are at risk. And, and Andy um, is has made great accommodation for his own family to protect them and to be supportive of his wife. So Andy, I'm not gonna speak for you, but jump in. But the overarching point that I wanted to make is if we're gonna have faith in, in what's going on, you're right, let's look to these people who are putting themselves in harm's way and know that they are putting themselves in harm's way, even yeah, as their colleagues are, are, are not uh, faring too well, so. Well, yeah. and that's, that's exactly right. And then I think that you have to think in terms of the people that are on the front lines in their jobs as healthcare professionals. It's ingrained in them, right? It's, of course, it's scary. Um, of course, they're worried about themselves, but probably because of the nature of most of them, they're worried more about their families, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, their patients. And I think that if you went from professional to professional and asked them individually, you know, they wouldn't be anywhere else, right? Because that's ingrained in their personalities and their spirit. Mm -hmm. that, that's what they do. That compassion. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we have governments that aren't giving them the proper equipment that they need is just horrid. Oh. It's absolutely abhorrent that the government uh, is, you know, applauding these people like we've talked about before, heroes. putting their faces yeah. on posters and saying, you're our heroes. Now get out there, but no, we're not going to give you a mask. Yeah, it's like sending soldiers into war without any armor or what they may need which we've done and we, we absolutely have done that on numerous occasions so. right right no and and i think with the ppe um it's it's like okay there's something bigger going on here and people need to pay attention because there are a lot of things bigger going on here i mean trump's out there every day on his uh little two hours speak things to wiggle the the shiny thing to get us all mad and talking about this that or the other thing whatever when he's just the clown the front man for a group of powerful people mm -hmm. who want to keep that power right right and you know who'd have ever thought that this country would be so absent in not only having stocked but in, in getting right away, even though it's a global pandemic, uh, what we need for the doctors and nurses and people close to this thing. So well, to take this back- Clearly we've, we've shown that, you know, that the United States is entirely based on a market economy. Yes. Right? That you, you look to the market in, in an unfettered capitalist society, you look to the market for every solution. Right? Mm -hmm. And clearly, there's no market solution to a pandemic that kills people right. because there's no profit in it, right? right? And so what's happened is the last five decades of, of neoliberal uh, uh, conditioning that says that you're the problem or poor people are the pro are, are the reason for all the problems in this country and a false sense of scarcity and we don't have enough money for you we'll bail out the corporations five million times over but we'd, we'd have nothing for you you know bootstraps take care of yourself free, free okay. you know, we always talk about you know free stuff um it's it's ridiculous and so the problem is now you're in the middle of a pandemic you have people that are now about to be directly affected right we have a society 
where the people there's still enough of you know the, the the middle class or the you know or higher that are still comfortable that haven't been made uncomfortable yet by what's happened and that's going to change in, in fast order because it's going to make people hungry because mm -hmm. our supply lines have now all broken down pretty soon there's not going to be enough food for everybody pretty soon yeah. there's going to be problems pretty soon there's going to be so many sick people that if your power goes off who's going to go out and fix it right, right. so right. people are about to become directly right. affected by this and that's going to rally people yeah, and this, this greed thinks that they have the answer in that they have been building, I think uh, I was warning people about Dick Cheney while he was vice president, his uh, Halliburton group um, making private prisons all over the country. Mm. And when did this start? There was already, they had six of them done, so I was sharing that. So there's the private prisons, there's the encampments of immigrants now that are everywhere. And so anybody that rises up against our money, you know, they will fight harder. And they think this is how they're going to win by fighting this hard. Um, so let's say to the, back to the election as we started started this conversation. Sure. And, and so to me, it, this comes full circle now because we started talking about where is the American public in, in all of this election, particularly in Wisconsin? But I would argue this started in Iowa and we all saw what happened in Iowa, but now we have some sort of collective amnesia that that just didn't happen. And then I, I live in Illinois, so I have railed against our own primary because what happened in Wisconsin happened in Illinois too, right? So we had already had people who had died from COVID and we went forward with our election um even though in the city of chicago you had polling places closed because poll workers just didn't show up and it was unannounced so all of these things going into it we didn't extend our mail-in ballot applications all of these things which made it unconstitutional by the state and federal constitutions but we all ignored that so so each and every step of the way, we've had one issue and then a bigger one and a bigger one and a bigger one. So we could see it in uh, Wisconsin, but I do want to make the point so that people understand. While a governor alone, first off, the DNC has no say so into a state primary. They can ask and they can put in a penalty of mon monetary support that's all they can do it's up to the state party so mm -hmm. if the state party wants to move their primary they work with in this case the governor the uh board of elections and then because of covid health and human services in the state and these organizations can get together and say yeah let's move it and we've seen that happen time and time again so for mm -hmm. illinois and uh, wisconsin and all of these others who say hey we just couldn't do it or we, we didn't want to fight the injunction. Um, and then in Wisconsin was m more egregious because uh, Republicans wanted to have their Supreme Court vote mm -hmm. uh, on the ballot. So, so it goes to gerrymandering at its finest, election rigging, which has always happened to a greater or lesser degree now on steroids. And, yes. it, and <laughs> Americans here, we're, we're still, we're still just so complacent and and, it, and distracted by the shiny objects and interruptions. We've been trained to react this way. And that was another question that I put in my original post that I sent to you was, do we want to spend the next decades in a reactive mode to clean up and fix all the things this administration is changing? And believe it, they're shredding the Constitution. They're ending systems of government. Um, he thinks he's king already, and there's a whole party back in him. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, I mean, are we ready to just keep... I, I've been at this for 50 w years. We've had small wins on things here and there, okay, that have lasted for a time. But they're all being threatened now. Women's rights, all of it. So it's like, you know... Do we want to keep 
trying to play catch up with the wrongdoing or do we want to use our voice for a change get in the streets if we carried signs it said 25th amendment now mm. and there were millions of us in every street across this country i think maybe some of that greed in those you know their fight and bite might tend to back off a little Here's my pushback on that. While I agree with you, I think we're missing a step that has to happen first. So everybody on this particular meeting right now, we're all white. So we are alarmed by what's happening now. But I'm going to go back to Dave Chappelle and a bunch of other people with their commentary when Trump was elected. They said um, all of this angst and fear and things that you're worried about, we've been dealing with for 200 years. Welcome to the club, right? So, yeah, exactly. right. So my my pushback and suggestion would be: in order for this coalition building to work, we have to have a real come to Jesus moment with ourselves, and acknowledge that women's rights and all of these things are secondary to the social justice movement. That it's it's got to be all of us or none of us. Exactly. I agree. I agree. And so if we do that first and we acknowledge brothers and sisters who are brown and black and indigenous people and, and how we, we personally on the left have ignored things and let mm -hmm. it go because it didn't affect me in white suburbia. If, if we really make a, a sincere effort, mm -hmm. Then I think that coalition building you're talking about, yeah, we can do it. And and it cannot be just over what we call women's rights or reproductive rights. It's oh, all yeah, of us. Exactly. And everybody wants to bring something else to the party you've designed. Mm -hmm. And so it gets, you know, many things involved. But no, I agree with you. You're absolutely right. And the only thing that I think in my head, <laughs> uh, that would bring all of us together for that one thing is we've got to stop in our little groups, wherever we live and whoever our friends are, uh, looking at our experiences in, in that bubble as the correct path or first path to uh, be passionate about justice. But we felt violated and so we did something, but we're doing something for maybe, you know, the white people or the black people because it happened to them over here or here over here. You have to look at the big thing. And like you said a minute ago, this is like on steroids. And I think the people have to react in one voice and all together to that kind of a situation. Or we're, I think we can lose our democracy very quickly. Hmm. While we're trying we also to heal. Want to, would want to push back on one thing that you said that, um, are you worried about it taking decades and decades to fix it? Uh, my major pushback on that would be that the change in climate is not going to give us that much time. Oh, you know, yeah, no, no, time. no. I mean, we don't even have two years here to come out of this virus and maybe heal before everything in our constitution and government is completely different. And what I'm trying to tell people is, given that short period of time, a year or two, you start shoving policies or medicines into healthcare and stopping the rightful healthcare. It takes very little time for all of those things to get into a system um, and become, this is how it is. This is the new way. This is, you know, and all those profiteers, you know, they're going to move forward and we're going to be the slaves. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, um, so uh, I just want to make a, a, a quick plug for what we're doing here, right? So um, the reason we started this entire organization was because of the pushback on corporate media, um, because we, we have so few uh, progressives and, and just real quickly progressive doesn't necessarily mean to the left progressive mm -hmm. means center policy and fiscally responsible yeah. socially responsible policy and we're seeing this in play right now why it's so necessary 
So it's it doesn't matter where you fall on the political spectrum. Once you understand what these policies are, exactly. how they work, federal spending, all of these things, you, you cannot call them far left or fringe left. So no, the, yeah. So no, the, I mean Cortez and the the girls, they're just trying to move things that have been forced so far to the right over decades now, just back to the center. Hey, did you forget? We're not way over here. We're really here. Right, so that, that's exactly right. I, I think your point earlier about uh, corporate media and then the funding. So this is what we're doing with Progressive Insiders. So um, our motto is, you know, the people that we cover may not be famous, but their stories should be which is part of the reason why we wanted Miss Cindy to tell her own story and make her own case. So with that, we have launched a uh, Patreon funding and I feel very strongly that this is the way to go. So for as little as like $3 a month, people can support progressive media as opposed to going to the Wall Street Journal where they're supposed to be the fourth branch of government, but you've got a paywall to get to even basic election information. We will not do a paywall up front, but we do ask for contributions. So I just want to make that plug. And then um, before we get out of here, Miss Cindy, you are an artist. And I am an artist. Uh, yeah, so yeah. would you tell people a little bit about what you do, how you do it, and how, how long you've been at this? Well, since I was a little girl. Uh, in third grade, I had a teacher tear up a picture I crayoned of five little girls holding hands because one of them had green hair and one of them had purple hair and she said there's no such thing. My dad was a fine arts <sighs> illustrator and he marched up there and said, don't you ever do anything like that. <laughs> Good for him, yeah. So, so I, I've been at it a long time and he taught me, uh, he, he allowed me to work for him from ages 12 to probably 18. Uh, he had a graphics business. Uh, he's the only artist I've ever known that raised like six or seven kids um, doing what he loved. Okay. And, uh, but so there's, there's all of that. I have my own business here in Washington State for a while. Uh, moved up here with some high school friends in like 73 or four. Have had some, uh, together with her, some shows and some of my own. And, uh, have probably sold hundreds and hundreds of pieces of work. Um, nothing for what I think they're really worth. Right. And they're kind of hard to get rid of anyway. They're like your babies. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, I've been very fortunate to that. And and, it, and it's a gift. I didn't do anything to do it. But my, my dad, uh, when I switched high schools in 12th grade the last year, the art teacher gave me a note said, take this up to the principal's office. So I did, and of course I read it on the way, mm -hmm. right? You know, it says, put Cindy in the advanced art classes. And he told me, yeah, I did that because you are, uh, you're doing second and third year college art. Oh, wow. So my dad was really good about that. And I get a lot of solace and peace in what I do. There's sometimes there's justice posters and other times it's nature. I love nature. So That's I have wonderful. a website and uh, it's posted on my Facebook page. No, no, tell us your website. Go ahead and tell us Come your on, website. You got it. You promote it, girlfriend. Come on, let's okay. do it. <laughs> it's Cindy Haddon Fine Art. Uh, dot Home, I think. Okay, okay. Yeah. Cindy okay. Haddon, fine and we'll post that so that everybody who sees this when they finally wake up uh, will we'll get a chance to go okay. check out your stuff. So. And in terms of the activism, I uh, put some stuff on my Facebook page. I, I put some of my albums of years past of the groups and photographs of people out doing justice if anybody's interested. Oh, oh no. I think we just lost Cindy. Oh, oh, oh. I, I can't tell. So I, I didn't hope. I hoped it wasn't me. <laughs> no, her her video froze. So, um, well, uh, okay, we're we're almost up at the hour anyway. So, um, Andy, thank you so yes. much. Um, do, you mind, do you mind if I tell a quick, a real quick story? No, absolutely. Um, Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So um, yesterday I had an appointment to give blood. And of course, I was very nervous about it. And so 
the blood donor clinic opened at two yesterday afternoon. So I called them and said, I have some reservations. I, I want to make sure that all of the people that are working there have a mask, right? That there are certain uh, criteria in that are being that are being met, that people are being safe, and it's all good. So they assured me it was. So I went down there, and the, all of the stuff that that the nurses had implemented, that the, the Canadian Blood Services had implemented, were quite good. I felt very comfortable, except that the four other blood donors that were in the clinic at the same time as me. None of them were wearing masks. They weren't social distancing. They were walking around, talking, you know, to people. So they still don't get it. Come on, people. Just a, just a little bit of effort. It, this is, I, nothing exemplifies more that we are all in this together than a global pandemic and just, just just a tiny bit of effort and and you help yourselves as well as others um so my my little rant uh is a gentleman on my my particular facebook page lovely gentleman a little bit older um his commentary was that he would risk his life to go vote and and my pushback was well it's not your life that you're necessarily risking it's everyone else yeah, you don't have the right to put other people in danger. That's why you have to social distance. That's exactly right. So um, on that note, I've got one comment here from Jeffrey on our Facebook page, and I think it's a good one to end on. He says, okay. um, share our similarities and explore our differences. So I, I think that's, you know, while we're all still sheltering in place and social distancing, uh, maybe use some of this time to do that in a positive, constructive way. And just shut up and listen. Listen as someone else is, is giving you their experience, their, their point of view, um, because you can learn from it without having to go through the exact same thing that they did. So, yeah. Well, we might have to do it virtually, but it, let's reconnect with one another. Right. Let's exactly. make time now that we have time let's make time for one another right and i just yeah. want to announce that at the end of all of this my wife and i have decided that we're having a big party called hug a palooza oh wonderful so yeah, there you go right all touchy feely <laughs> yeah. yeah if you're not comfortable with hugs don't come <laughs> I will admire from afar. So, <laughs> all right. On that note, thank you everybody for joining us and special thank you to Miss Cindy. So make sure you go check out her website, cindyhaddenfineart.com. And again, we'll post that here. And then also, if you appreciate what we're doing, maybe a tip. Um, well, we have a PayPal, so it's paypal.me slash progressiveinsider.com. Uh, no, yeah, paypal.me slash progressive insider, and that should get you there. Or if you go to patreon.com slash progressive insider, you can just for like $3 a month support the programming that we're doing, and we are actually growing. We're bringing on two new fantastic um, citizen journalists themselves, one from North Carolina and one from Detroit. So very excited to have them join our network as well as help us share news and commentary from around the country, around the world. Um, and to, on that note, Nancy Robertson in Jordan, thank you so much for your kind assistance helping us tell the story about Syrian refugees living in Jordan who are also dealing with this pandemic at the same time. So um, with that, thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Carrie. Take care. Thanks.